uh, it's my pleasure uh, this morning to stand before you and talk about what I think is probably one of the most uh, critical issues going on uh, right now, not just in our local area, but really uh, statewide and regionally and really across the country. Uh, Greg and I had the opportunity uh, earlier last year to travel overseas, and we were speaking about it yesterday while we were in Italy. Uh, we found over there, and speaking to the manufacturers there, they likewise were having issues with workforce and workforce development and uh, locating and finding the right people that would show up to work and, and do the jobs that they needed in order to make themselves, uh, to make themselves successful. Closer to you. Thank you. And uh, we, we recognize, and working with you, and again, we also appreciate, and I appreciate particularly all of you coming today and taking out your time and your busy schedules and the important things that each one of you do for your companies. Uh, but what we want to have happen is for you to all be successful. And we certainly want all of the folks uh, in our community, and by that I mean really this regional area that we live within, uh, to have real opportunities uh, for real jobs, uh, to be able to actually put food on the table for their families and their kids, and to be able to grow our community uh, in so many different ways. If folks uh, don't have uh, have uh, ability to have a decent job, then they lose hope, and, and some of these many other issues, social issues that we see and read about every day continue to get worse instead of better. We clearly in Anderson are on the right track. Uh, we continue to work very, uh, very aggressively on economic development. Uh, we continue to bring new jobs into the community. Uh, there really isn't a job out there uh, that's not available for someone if they have uh, certain soft skills. I was just talking to Ken a few moments ago, as we all know about you know being able to pass a drug test, to show up, to try, to to actually come more than one or two days in a row and then take off. Uh, you guys need more than that if you're going to be successful, and we need our people to be better than that if we're going to be successful. So the real goal is, is what do we do to, to come together and to work together to try to advance uh, the opportunities for people to be able to, to, to get the skills necessary. And I know our friends at uh, uh, Joanne's here, I know our friends, her and Vince, they work hard, uh, Workforce One, to, to try to, again to, to reach out and the various educational institutions we have here do the same thing. But our goal is to come together, and Greg and I have been talking about some ideas which we'll later uh, lay out at a different time. I don't want to take up uh, Secretary Milo's time today, uh, but about some ideas we have with regards to trying to put together a boot camp type of operation where working with uh, the local manufacturers, the local business, the local schools, and some of the social agencies that we will identify people to come through a program that will put them in a position to come out and get a better education. But again, uh, that's for another day, and for what we're here for today in part is, is to listen to, to some of the ideas and, and some of the wisdom that has been picked up uh, by our guest uh, that was so kind to be here. I first had the opportunity to meet uh, Blair Milo at the uh, uh, ribbon cutting and dedication, I guess is what it was, uh, when we were here just a few months ago, and many of you were here uh, during that period of time as well. Uh, I have Milo's, uh, Ms. Milo's uh, 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 resume in front of me. It's a long resume, I'm not gonna read it all, I'm just going to sort of paraphrase uh, from some of the points because it, it's, it's quite impressive. Um, Ms. Milo served, was born and raised in, in LaPorte, Indiana, uh, went to high school there, uh, graduated, and went on to Purdue University. Uh, she graduated from Purdue back in 1994 and uh, received a political science degree. And after a political science degree, she also, I believe, became an ensign at that time, commissioned, and went into the, into the military. She spent uh, up until 2010 in the active military doing many things um, in that regards. Uh, she served as a surface warfare officer in the United States Navy uh, previously when she came out in, into the reserves. Uh, but when she was in active duty, she served, um, let me find that here. She, uh, again, in the Navy, she served as the, uh, served at the anti-submarine warfare officer, and then she was also an electrical officer in the USS Mason from January of 05 to May of 07. Uh, she completed two Persian Gulf deployments, so thank you so much for your service, for sure. Uh, you then transferred to the Destroyer Squadron. Uh, it was based in Mar uh, uh, Manama, also Baran, and she served as an assistant operations officer and daily schedule in the Northern Arabian Gulf battle space and the public affairs officer and tactical watch officer for the commander. Uh, while after serving in Bran in Iraq, she also then transferred to as the chief of naval operations staff at the Pentagon, where she worked at the Navy's newest stealth destroyer uh, ship class, DDG-1000, in addition to serving in the Admiral's aid and special assistance to the director of surface warfare. Fortunately for all of us, she chose to leave the military, went into the reserves. She, uh, she currently uh, serves as a lieutenant uh, commander while she is in the reserves. 
uh, but she returned to her hometown, as I said earlier. She ran for, uh, ran for mayor of Laporte. She was the youngest person to be elected uh, to serve as mayor uh, in 2011. She fulfilled that term. She ran for re-election, and she was re-elected. While she served, she did many things within her community. Her community, of course, is up north of about 22 or so thousand folks living in a really a regional area made up of, of, uh, of a much larger population. Uh, but up there, she was able to create a business environment where she had substantial investment come into her community and create over 1,100 jobs within the relatively short time that she was there. She also played a key role in the expansion of their industrial park and redevelopment of brownfield areas uh, to, again, bring back quality of life and good quality jobs for her community. So it was no surprise, of course, that she was uh, reelected. Uh, but while she was doing all that, uh, Vice President Pence, when he was governor at the time, called upon her to serve on the State Workforce Innovation Council and chair the Career Counseling Task Force, which she was doing. Um, after, Lieutenant, or after Governor Holcomb took office, he called upon Secretary Milo and asked if she would be willing to come to the state. And so she chose to um, resign from her position as mayor and take over as what is now the Secretary of uh, Career, uh, Career Connection and Talent. And it's in that position that I think she comes to us today to explain some of the efforts and work that she's putting forth and giving us all some good ideas to try to continue to advance uh, what we would like to see done here in this community and across the state. So it's my pleasure as mayor and just being here in the community to welcome you back. And thank you for coming and sharing your time. And so may I now uh, have a warm welcome to Blair Milo. Well, thank you, Mayor, and thank you all for that uh, warm welcome. I'm excited to be back in this incredible facility that it was fantastic to get to come and share with you all as you're doing the dedication a few months back and was sharing with the team uh, how fantastic this facility that is uh, and I think is a, a great sort of physical embodiment of a lot of the conversation we'll have in just a little bit about uh, the, the talent pipeline concept and, and having the kind of collaboration that is so critical uh, for success in the future that it's, it's fantastic to see this all come together here and then get to utilize it a little bit to have some of this conversation. Uh, that you got to hear a little bit of some of the background there that uh, while I loved the opportunity to get to serve as mayor, one of the uh, chief challenges we kept running into was, was seeing that we were growing jobs and, and business climate and opportunity, but we were really struggling to get people into these new positions and having uh, the, the businesses and our citizens be able to take advantage of this uh, great opportunity coming forward. And so uh, when Governor Holcomb presented the idea to me of this concept of, of career connections and talent and what we would be focusing on and uh, being able to address in the mission field, then uh, I've been excited to be a part of an incredible team that's really very dedicated on addressing uh, this challenge in, in, a, in a number of different ways. And uh, for, for today's purpose, uh, wanted to then share a little bit of the, the, the plan ahead of talking a little bit about what this new concept is of career connections and talent. Uh, and then doing a little bit of a snapshot of what the, the trend is that we see for, uh, the, for Madison County here. And uh, we've, we've been able to correlate some data in a way that I think is pretty helpful in thinking about talent, supply, and demand. And uh, having that information maybe inform a little bit of, of our thoughts of, of where we may want to focus some things. And then having a conversation about what are the tools that we have available uh, to then be able to gather that information and uh, share it with all of our different partners in, in ways that we can grow some of the collaboration. And then having a discussion as well about what we think is going well, some, some takeaways that you may have that you'd like to share of saying that if, if more regions did this kind of a concept, then uh, this would be really helpful, or if you could help us do 
X, Y, or Z, then that would help us grow our efforts. Um, and, and really just talking through the positives, the negatives, and how we can better collaborate and work with all of you, of our, our various stakeholders. Uh, and, and these are conversations that we're working towards having across the state in order to further develop uh, our pipeline overall. Uh, but we'll get into some of those in, in just a minute. Before we do all of that, though, I'd just like to get a little bit of a sense of who all we have uh, in, in the audience here that I know, and I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to sort of crash your manufacturer's council uh, party this morning, so thank you for that opportunity. So I, I know that we've got a lot of representation from manufacturers, and so all the employers, I guess, and, and uh, business folks that are here, if you could raise your hand, that's, that'd be helpful. Okay, excellent. How about from the education space? Very good, okay. How about uh, city folks? Or local government, I should say. Excellent, okay. Uh, economic development? Any economic development? Very good. Uh, let's see, nonprofits. Any nonprofits? Very good. And what other groups am I missing here? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Are there are there other entities that maybe I missed? Some of these business folks. Workforce. Oh, the. Entrepreneurs. Okay. Entrepreneurs. Workforce development. Um, so all the workforce development people. Got a few, a few over here. Other subsets. Okay. Very good. Transportation and okay, very good. So that gives us all helps me and gives everyone else a sense here of of all the different entities in the room that are really critical to this discussion overall. Uh, and we'll kind of break up in a little bit. That I'm actually going to have us move to this area to be able to utilize some of the workspace over here to hopefully have a mixture of all of these different entities be able to to converse with one another. That we see a variety of, of levels of where the collaboration is uh, across different areas. My sense with uh, having this facility, having heard some of the stories of things that are going on here in Anderson, is that uh, there's some really great momentum happening here already with the the co collaboration that's that's taking place. Um, but we not we don't always know about those kinds of efforts and both at the state level and sometimes locally. Uh, and so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. And moving forward on, on some of the plan overall of just what is this career connections and talent concept that the, the name, while is, it is a mouthful, uh, I think really does help address what is a pretty broad area when we think about workforce and uh, talent pipelines and all these different pieces. And as there's so many elements that play a role in affecting our preparedness and, and making sure that people have opportunities to, to take advantage of, of growth areas that uh, it's been helpful for me to be able to sort of bucket this into two different aspects, that there is a current workforce challenge that we see right now of, uh, that the governor shared, uh, I guess it was last week with his state of the state address of talking about that there are around 85,000 plus or minus a few uh, vacancies that are existing in the job market right now. And so how can we close those gaps and ensure that Hoosiers are able to take advantage of these good, these really great jobs that are out there, and that our businesses are able to have the workforce that they need uh, to be able to, to meet demands and growth opportunities. Uh, while, so, so we need to close those gaps while we're also thinking about uh, that the, the nature of work is changing faster than we've ever seen it change. And I'm excited to have uh, Pete Batar here, who's been leading an effort with the State uh, Workforce Innovation Council that's really digging further into this discussion of the future of work. Uh, because we are seeing so much uh, change at an accelerated pace that we're, no, we're recognizing 
that for today's kindergartners, when they're going to step into the workforce, around 60% of the jobs that they're going to be taking don't yet exist. So how do we inform the experience that those students are going to have all throughout their educational uh, timeline that then prepares them for the types of jobs that we can't know exactly what they're going to look like, but we can ensure that they're getting the kinds of skills and experiences along the way that are going to help them uh, be ready to step into those roles and having those critical thinking opportunities, some of the uh, hands-on learning and uh, whether they step into a, a science, technology, engineering, or math area uh, or not, having some some of that thought process that informs the, the roles that they may be taking so that then as we see the nature of work changing in so many different ways that then our students are prepared to be able to take advantage of those opportunities and we're not in this position where we're having to try and sort of, of triage some of the, the gaps overall. We've got these 85,000 vacancies that are a pain point for many of us. Uh, I certainly felt in, in the city of LaPorte and in many conversations with employers, with fellow mayors across the state is how are we closing these gaps now? How can we address having the software patches to, to make sure that we're getting our employers and our, our, our Hoosiers the opportunity to be able to serve in these roles while also then thinking about what's that baseline going to be, the software baseline that allows us to, to not have to do these patches here and there to ensure that the entire system is talking to one another on a, a regular basis so that you're having the right experiences for students coming up through an educational pipeline to get ahead of where gaps may exist in the future. And that's kind of been the, what helps me organize just all these different elements that are a part of this process. Uh, before I go into some of the, the resource mapping piece, which I think helps inform some of the, uh, the, the uh, gap areas, closing the gap areas, I do want to, I should mention some of the tools that we have for closing that. And then I want to drill in a little bit on some of the uh, data that we have specific to Madison County. And uh, I think it'll probably be hard to even see it on our screens here, so I'll rely on you being able to see uh, the pieces that are going to be on the sheet that's at the very back of your packet there. Uh, that we'll, we'll pull this up in a second. Uh, but before we do that, I do want to talk a little bit about some of the, the programs that we have and, and the goal setting that we have for ourselves to uh, ensure that we are, are driving towards outcomes and having the, the process meet that, uh, those goals. And so talking about the, the software patches, we are, are working towards system alignment and accountability and having uh, outcomes and goals drive that process. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of those specifics in just a second. Uh, enhancing some of the career navigation support and uh, enhancing some of the support to career counselors in both the, the student space and the adult space to ensure that folks are, are aware of what the different kinds of opportunities may be and that they may be different than some of the previous thoughts that we've had of what those jobs look like uh, as, as so many influences have changed those in, in many different ways from technology to uh, the global market and connectedness that we have to all those different areas. And looking to increase some of our work-based learning areas and apprenticeship programs so that we're having people experience the, the job environment and, and the types of roles in a way that they're able to uh, determine if that's going to be the right fit and employers are able to start to have pe more people be able to uh, connect into what the opportunities may ex exist in their companies overall. And a couple of the, the tools that we now have in the toolbox uh, are, I, I think, very valuable that uh, we have a next level jobs program that is aimed towards individuals as well as employers that the individual component helps allow it any, anybody who may be interested in receiving a certificate in a high wage, high demand area is able to access that free of charge. And that is through a partnership uh, that 
Ivy Tech and Vincennes University have uh, with the state. And so 100% tuition uh, coverage through nextleveljobs.org that, again, anybody who wants to access a certificate can go to nextleveljobs.org, fill out about a five-click application uh, to then be able to slot into one of those certificate areas. And the, the five high-wage, high-demand areas that we've seen based upon the, the trends and the input of, like I say, the demand, the volume of demand, as well as then where those wages place people, uh, are in health and life sciences, and business and IT services, advanced manufacturing, uh, the transportation distribution logistics area, and building and construction services. We also have an employer training grant that is a part of that, that again, those, those high wage, high demand areas where any employer that has, uh, that, that fits into those categories is able to receive uh, reimbursement for training of up to $2,500 for an individual that is a new hire coming on board for at least six months, and then they can receive up to $25,000 uh, per employer. And we've uh, had those programs since about mid-August, actually August 14th, that was my first day on the job, and uh, we had the opportunity to, to start sharing that these were going to be programs uh, f that the individuals across the state could take advantage of, and we've seen tremendous traction with that already. And they both are meant to be pri our pilot programs that we're continuing to look at how we can tweak them to grow utilization of getting individuals connected up with the training that lead to jobs and employers uh, connected up with some training resources to get the individuals into those positions that exist overall. And there's also a focus on uh, ensuring that we are getting some of our transitioning population coming out of the Department of Corrections slotted into some opportunities in the workforce so that then uh, it, pre it prevents or pre presents opportunity for those individuals, for the businesses, as well as reducing recidivism rates and reducing cost for uh, society on the whole so that it's a win for everybody involved. And as I mentioned before, we are uh, focusing on outcomes and having those goals drive the process. So Governor Holcomb shared in his State of the State address that we have these 85,000 jobs that we know are, are vacancies across the state. What are some ways that we are going to close those? And by uh, identifying targets that we are, are trying to serve people in this process and getting them connected up with these opportunities, we have specific populations that we are moving uh, along the process to design metrics around to ensure that we are closing these gaps and providing opportunity for our businesses and, and our workforce overall. Those are broken down into 25,000 Hoosiers uh, who have some college but haven't completed a degree, a degree just yet. We know that there's over 700,000 people who fit into that category across the state. Our goal, our initial goals are to move 25,000 of those individuals into having uh, a, a full certificate or degree and then ultimately connecting into a job uh, that requires that degree that we have around 475,000 Hoosiers who do not have a high school diploma or a high school equivalency. And our uh, goal is to get at least 30,000 of those connected up with uh, either a job or then ideally with the job that then involves getting the high school diploma or equivalency along the way to being able to slot into that. Uh, a thousand inmates being connected with uh, certification for direct employment. And I was just at an event earlier this week that they rolled out uh, the new last mile program, which is a coding program that will be utilized initially at a, a women's prison where they're getting uh, some of the, the women connected up with coding uh, training to then be able to slot into uh, some of these, these high wage, high demand uh, areas. And that's just one area where we are, are gonna do more efforts across the correction system to get individuals connected up with the training so that as they're transitioning out, they'll be able to step into uh, some of these roles that need to be filled. And then it connects them up with the resources and an environment to help uh, be able to make some of those positive life choices overall. 
a goal of 12,500 new participants in uh, work-based learning or apprenticeship program, or uh, yeah, participants in the programs. I'm laughing a little bit that uh, I just recently uh, was corrected in realizing that the 12,500 is for participants in the program. Uh, I was initially thinking we were going to grow that number of programs across the state. I still think we ought to shoot for it, but uh, <laughs> apparently that's a little ambitious. But uh, as I mentioned before, by having these work-based learning and, and apprenticeship type opportunities, it helps those students or adult learners to be able to connect up with what that, what's that like to be able to work in that type of a job and that environment for that employer. It also is a great opportunity for some of our underemployed individuals to be able to continue to have access to a wage while earning the training that they need to be able to step into uh, a greater opportunity and, and utilizing some more skills that I think that's often a, a challenge for some of the folks that then present, prevents, or presents a barrier uh, for those individuals to be able to have some of that upward economic mobility. And we're also then targeting having 200, at least 250 uh, next level jobs, employer training grants that right now, uh, I think we're at just a little over two million, I'll look at, uh, I thought Gina Ashley was here, two million that I think have been, has been appropriated, is that right, Gina? But uh, just, again, since mid-August that we rolled that out, that um, that's how fast we've been able to get the money turned around to be able to get uh, the, it in the, invested in the hands of our employers, uh, and that, at, Application is meant to be as easy as possible for our employers to utilize. Again, it's about five clicks or so to be able to go through the process and ensure that uh, we're providing more opportunity and, and support for these kinds of programs overall. And I have on the right-hand side there, then again, looking at the future challenge piece with the talent pipelines, uh, that we have the, the goals of creating the Education and Career Pathways Cabinet which is uh, a group that I have the opportunity to chair this uh, organization that's made up of uh, myself, the uh, superintendent for public instruction, Dr. McCormick, the commissioner for higher education, Teresa Lubbers, the commissioner for workforce development, Fred Payne, and the director of the office Ma of management and budget, who, uh, Micah Vincent. And we've just started having some conversations of developing a mission statement and some guiding principles overall uh, working to serve as an, an entity that can build a framework to be able to provide to local or regional talent cabinets where uh, the, the real work and, and uh, decision making and programming eventually will be able to lie to have a system that is truly locally designed and carried forth based off of the input and, and tailored by the needs of the community while informed by some of the work that we'll do at the state level uh, to ensure that our students have an experience that's going to make them globally competitive, uh, but making sure that we're also developing a pipeline that is tailored to some of the needs of the community uh, as, as we see them coming forward. And as we see so much change happening across the landscape of work, by having a, a talent system that is as flexible and nimble as possible, thereby being driven locally uh, is, is where we're going to be able to see that adaptability come forward as best as possible. Uh, there's a couple other pieces associated with that of uh, a target of 250 JAG programs. JAG is a, a program called Jobs for America's Graduates, and it's a, a great resource for being able to help connect some of the, the, the population that may be at risk within high school of potentially dropping out to ensure that they are uh, getting the support and the experiences needed to then see what kinds of jobs they can connect into when they graduate and getting some of that all along the way. And there's a tremendous success rate of uh, graduation for all of those individuals. So want to continue growing those programs. Governor Holcomb has actually just stepped forward and, and been selected to serve as the chair, the national chair uh, for the, the JAG program overall. And uh, the last piece there being a goal of uh, having every school have access to a computer science uh, program. That we see it happening in 
a, a small percentage of our schools thus far, and certainly a recognition that so many of our schools want to do that, uh, but there may be some challenges in having the career development for some of the teachers to be able to have that information and also resources for providing that. And that's where we've identified this as a goal to then say, okay, how do we make this happen as we all recognize how important it is?